Hello, Austin Harris. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you hear me, I guess? Uh, I'm not sure should I already start. Or, uh, well, I, I think you so well. So, um, I think yeah, yeah. Uh, you can start. So, welcome back, everyone. Okay. The first half was the afternoon where we had the talk, and we were talking about analytic personalization. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation to speak for uh, the Indian Olds uh, birthday conference. Uh, I, it's an honor and I'm very happy to speak at this occasion. Unfortunately, I really couldn't make it work to travel to Paris this week. So unfortunately, you will have to uh, listen to me over video. Um, so I want to talk about a current joint work in progress uh, with Johannes Anschluss, Artis Susanne Bobas, and Juan Esteban Rodriguez Camargo about <clears throat> What we call analytic personalization, and so um, let me try to to give a little bit of uh, motivation. Um, and so, 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 so roughly speaking, the goal is to uh, move prismatic homology. <laughs> uh, from the setting of formal schemes. Uh, to the setting of their generic virus, or to the setting of which uh, analytic variety. And maybe I'll make Was that a question? Uh, maybe I'll start by briefly recalling uh, <clears throat> a little bit about how prismatic homology works for formal schemes and then say why. Why well, it's not not completely obvious how to, to move it towards uh, the varieties. Um, so, so let's, let's say something about cosmetic homology. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the setting in which uh, Bud and I first uh, defined this was the following: so you, you start with a prism um, AI. Uh, I will say in a second uh, what kind of structure this is and uh, give an example. And then prismatic homology um, goes from <clears throat> some, some kind of all schemes, maybe smooth, maybe all of them, over uh, A mod I, the quotient. And go to module splitting over all of it. <clears throat> and actually, it equips uh, with a convenient solution. <clears throat> um, and uh, so here, A um, is what's called a delta ring, um, which, <clears throat> and maybe it's P complete. Uh, can it be complete? Um, so the delta ring just means that it comes with a specified Frobenius ring. Um, at least the, it, it's P thousand three, and then all you have to slide, be slightly careful about phrasing the condition of being a Frobenius ring. <coughs> and in there, you have I, which is just a Cartier divisor. So just a locally principal ideal. Um, which satisfies a certain technical condition of being of degree one. So uh, the state of a prism is something, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's not very complicated structure, just a ring with a Frobenius lift and a certain divisor of degree one. Um, and maybe the easiest example to think about is, uh, is a so-called broad keeping print. <clears throat> Where uh, A would be the ring ZP power to is U. Oh, they, uh, so ring should also be either P from C. Um, ZP power series U on which the Frobenius X 
for selling new to the team. <coughs> so evidently, this is a propenius lift, and the ideal i is the ideal generated by u minus <coughs> And then, in particular, A mod I is just the team. Um, and so this is really just the cohomology series for the uh, formal schemes of the ZP uh, and producing uh, structures over here. And so then if you look at, um, at what you get, then you get something living over this kind of two-dimensional regular local ring where you have two directions, one is from the P and one is the U. <coughs> And one uh, special locus here is the vanishing locus of I, which is exactly the diagonal. Um, and then, yeah, so, 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 so any form of scheme X gives you some quadratic form all of X. Um, so I'll live over uh, this whole picture. <coughs> And then uh, when you specialize to various parts of this picture, you get various non homology series. For example, when you specialize uh, to the part where u is equal to zero, but they, or to yeah, so the whole thing where u is equal to zero, uh, you get crystalline homology of special fibers. Um, when you specialize uh, to the part where uh, near p equal to zero on the gen uh, generic fiber, you get something uh, which is essentially a tall homology, um, at least if x is proper, uh, modulo some comparison isomorphism in the PLA cost theory. Um, when you specialize to the fifth divider, you get something that's essentially Hobbs homology, or more precisely what's known as Hobbs state homology. <clears throat> and then there's also the locus which is a Frobenius image uh, of this u equal to p, which is the locus where uh, u is equal to p to the p, uh, there you will get the wrong homology. <coughs> All right. And then. <coughs> Um, so I should say a charcoal homology is a generic fiber exercise. Um, and then there was this realization by uh, Bart and Lurie and by Drixel that there's really a different way to think about this. That there's really a functor that takes any x uh, to a certain formal algebraic check x prism. Let's just touch function. The so called prismatization of x. Um, <clears throat> such that the uh, prismatic cohomology of x is nothing else than just the quasi coherent cohomology of x prism. Well, maybe this is a prismatization over A. And also here is a prismatic homology of X over A, being in the relative setting. Um, just the, the yeah, probably coherent homology of prismatization over A. <clears throat> and then once you think in terms of these stacks, and instead of having just a description of cohomology, what you should rather not just describe the cohomology, but really the geometry of the stack. And so this turns out to be a very fruitful perspective, and you can actually you know, describe describe this stack, many parts of the stack. In particular, um, <coughs> there is a, uh, a specialization to the quantitative devices. Um, yields from a much state side. Um, uh, 
And the structure of the Hodge data set can be understood rather explicitly. <coughs> Namely, I mean, this kind of relative setting I'm working right now, um, this Hodge state stack of X will always map back to X. <coughs> and it will be a certain jerk. <laughs> Bandit essentially by the tangent bundle of, of X, by the certain PD thickening thereof. So you have a zero section inside the tangent bundle of X, and then take the PD half of X. Um, <clears throat> and, then, and then it's an easy exercise. Well, actually, this jerk is often in this uh, form of scheme setting, it's often actually split. And once you split it, you get an equivalence between the partner theory and chiefs on here and uh, the Higgs bundles uh, using some kind of Cartier duality. Uh, <coughs> relates vector bundles on X of state. Oh, excuse me, the Higgs bundles. Possibly twisted because of the third one, smart piece. Um, <clears throat> and so in this way, uh, these hot state stacks they actually are also closely related uh, to some kind of periodic Simpson correspondence. All right, and so. My motivation was to try to pass the generic fibers so we would like to um, uh, to pass the generic fibers. <laughs> the problem is that if you naively take just a generic fiber of this picture, um, <clears throat> what what this is a somehow a jet banded by a certain subset of the tangent bundle. But this tangent bundle this depends on which subset somehow depends on the form model you chose, uh, because you know, it's some kind of subset of a specific radius, more or less. But, <laughs> but somehow you need the metric on the tangent bundle to say which which thing it is. So um, so this, this the generic file of the such text like manifestly depends on the form model. Uh, you need to form a model to somehow specify uh, which subset of the tangent bundle we get in the jerk. <clears throat> so, uh, so it's subtle. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, but um, uh, there's been a lot of progress recently on understanding the static call it Simpson correspondence, uh, in particular. Uh, by Ben Hoyer, there was a lot of progress, and there's also a certain paper by Anschick, Spire, and Lebras, um, uh, where they do the following structure. Um, I mean, they, in their paper, they somehow didn't quite have the language to say that cleanly, but uh, that's basically what they showed. Um, there is a functor 
uh, from say uh, means for simplicity again uh, written as the variety. And again, to simplify my life, um, physically I'm working in some kind of relative setting or I work over a geometric base field. Um, so let's say with CT. Um, uh, to, to ignore some kind of arithmetic phenomena uh, for the moment. Um, towards some kind of analytic stacks. Uh, or the same here. Um, analytic stacks now uh, actually is a sense of uh, that Justin Feldman and I developed. Um, taking any such uh, news rich space to what's called the analytic or stack. Uh, we could launch data shake stack. Um, and so, what structure does this now have? Um, so again, this is something that maps back to X, <clears throat> and this is jerk banded by some version of the tangent bundle. <clears throat> um, but if you would choose a full tangent bundle, uh, this would actually be the least interesting thing because. Like if you have a jerk bandit by something small, you can always push it out and get a jerk bandit by something larger. And in some sense, the category of project and she's become smaller in the process. Um, so we would like to have something that's banded by something that's as small as possible. Uh, so in particular, we would like to be smaller than any, any ball. I mean, there's no specific ball. So the best thing we can choose, like this over conversion label, this is the zero section, uh, which is defined to be uh, the intersection of all of all open neighborhoods uh, of zero of p. Uh, now, this intersection, if you take it in some kind of naive sense, it might end up maybe being just a zero section, or I mean, it's not quite clear what structure it has. The way to resolve that is to declare that the intersection here that you're taking corresponds to, on the level of algebra. So like, Passing to the, to, to the dual like algebra functions on this to correspond to the non-completed, so just the abstract whole, uh, filter coordinates of works. If you restrict to some FM pieces, if you know it, pieces. <laughs> so it's, it's some algebra. So it's some algebra of over convergent functions uh, along the zero section. So this is something that is well-defined and that's very small, so that's so it's good. Um, actually, to be very precise, I should put a t-twist here, but let me ignore the t-twist because I'm working over an algebraic and close to the next. Can you say something? Can you hear the questions? Or? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm lost with a uh, map. It goes to x, really? See, uh, yes, see it goes to x, yeah. Uh -huh. But X is the uh, initial uh, rigid analytic variety. X is a rigid analytic variety, yes. Ah, now I understand. Yeah. It's like yeah. Not. I apologize. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and so actually, this uh, Ben Hoyer showed that this jerk here is always non trivial uh, when X is not a point. Um, uh, so I mean, in, in this formal scheme setting, actually, you could usually trivialize a jerk, uh, but that's because it's bent by something rather large. But if you really take the intersection of all balls, it really becomes always a, a non-trivial jerk, even even on 
small pieces of of X. Uh, so the same thing literature to Europe, uh, then it becomes questionable. But like locally in some rather fine topology on X, you can't split. So maybe you need to go to perfectoid covers or something like this. So split. <laughs> And so again, uh, like vector bundles on on this analytic of state stack. Uh, if they if they wasn't this twist by this jerk, they would just literally be Higgs bundles on X uh, mm -hmm. because of the twist. Uh, it's, it's some kind of funny twisted version from there. Um, actually, Barger, uh, after my talk, Barger was speaking, he was telling about a different incarnation of the same twist uh, and how it appears in the Felix Simpson verse one as well. All right, so, so here are some questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the two other parts. Of the privatization in the formal sense, uh, it admit analytic versions. Mm -hmm. Um, another question you might ask is. So actually, the original construction of the analytic of state stack uh, was pretty indirect using some kind of a tar unification. <laughs> then there was a different proposal: how long can you use some kind of non-completed perfection of the of the formal prismatization to get it? But all very indirect. Uh, really, one would like some kind of moduli description of the such state stack. So, what is the functor of point of the analytic of state stack? Because this is something that you can do for the prismatization. So, um, yeah. So. Can one, uh, and so I, I mean, the idea picture is really that one can define a category of analytic prisms. You mean? So the camera periodically uh, goes out of focus. Can you do anything? <laughs> no, no, it's good. Uh, it's yeah. you know, this issue also, also existed when I gave my course with, with Dustin. Uh, we never quite figured out how to solve it. <laughs> Um, can one define a category of, of uh, analytic prisms? Many ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> yielding the corresponding theory of analytic prismatization, analytic prismatization model, etc. Um, giving all giving all those versions. <clears throat> right. I mean, before we can somehow really try to attack question two, we should maybe have an idea of what what things we're looking for. Um, and so, so let me first uh, explain some other parts of this prismatization of X that have such analytic versions. Sorry. Sorry. So, so, so I have a question. So, 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 so when you have, you do have a formal model, then does this, I mean, Hodge state stack, I mean, how is it related to the, the, the Hodge uh, state? Yes, there, there is a map. So, whoop, 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 whoop. so you have the analytic Hodge state stack of X <laughs> maps to X, and X somehow sits in some sense in the formal model. So, it maps to the formal model. Uh, here you have the Formal hot state stack and comparison map. <clears throat> so in particular, like it maps to the generic fiber, but it's something finer because you made the band smaller. But it's not a fiber square. 
it's not a fiber square. Yeah? I mean, that's what I said. I mean, if it just takes a fiber product, you can just get the generic fiber of the formal hot state set. But this is not a good object. Because the band is a specific ball in the tangent bundle that depends on the metric on the tangent bundle. So, so let me start with question one and give some examples. <clears throat> Um, so I said that another part of uh, of of the prism adaptation is so uh, you, you get the round homology, uh, and so let's first discuss how one can get something like round homology setting. So that's so called analytic round set. Uh, that was uh, found by. <clears throat> um, so again, uh, yeah, so let's say X was over CP, smooth, rigid space. <clears throat> um, then there is this analytic to ROM stack, which is defined to be or either it's a definition or it's a theorem that it's the same thing, is this not actually a quotient um, of X? And it's a quotient, well, usually, I mean, there's this thing that uh, Simpson first observed, that one way to think about D modules on X is in terms of project variant sheaves on the Durham stack, which is a quotient of X by the formal completion along the diagonal, so we identify formally closed points. Um, but in this analytic theory, we should do more. We should identify points which are somehow over convergently close. Uh, so we take the over convergent neighborhood of the diagonal. So delta of x dagger is in the same way as this intersection over there with the tangent bundle, is intersection of all other neighborhoods inside of x times x uh, of u. So, and what's the group structure on this? Is it like a convolution product or something? Hmm? I mean, you're taking a quotient, it should be some kind of group object when you take the Yeah, quotient. I mean, this is literally just an equivalence relation on here. So it's, oh, okay. it's literally a subset which happens to be an equivalence relation. Right. <clears throat> um, uh, right. Uh, so, if it, uh, so there's a similar DROM stack that you could get out of specializing something for formal schemes, but again, there you would be quotienting out by some PD thickening of like the zero section inside uh, uh, of the diagonal. And again, this PD thickening is giving you some kind of larger balls, whereas here we're again taking some intersection. So it's very, very similar to what happens uh, on the state locus. Um, and something that the guess Kamalu shows us is that if you look at the quantum current sheaves on the thing, uh, then they're essentially the same thing as uh, the decap modules uh, of Arakov and Watchley. <clears throat> and uh, using the six functor formalism that we defined on analytic stacks, he's able to get a very general six functor formalism for such decap modules.
All right. So then, uh, next, so then there is something funny you can do. You can take the analytic ROM stack of a different answer. Um, this point, you start with X over C, which is now any state algebraically close for simplicity for vector Q. Maybe of characteristic zero, but it might also be of characteristic T. And now C prime will be a second such, also an algebraic close for vector field, which is a different anti old. So the tilt of these two things are the more. <clears throat> so then something you can do is you can take the tilde of x, which is now some diamond over, over the tilde of c flat, <clears throat> and then take the other until. So now this is some kind of some kind of stack in perfectoids over c, c prime. <clears throat> um, and it turns out that this is sufficient amount of data in order to define an analytic ROM stack. So uh, there's some less data than having a smooth rigid space. I mean, this is not a smooth rigid space, but it's still sufficient data to somehow perform this analytic ROM stack construction. Um, so basically, you can take a cover of this by some perfectoid, and then, I mean, this is some quotient of some perfectoid, and now you just take the overconvergent neighborhood of the of 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 of, uh, of the equivalence relation. So this is some of some some y mod r, and then if you take some y mod r and take its analytic ground stack, it is y mod the overconvergent neighborhood of the diagonal uh, of the equivalence relation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it turns out that uh, so so the C prime where we want to do this uh, the C prime is of characteristic zero uh, because like D modules are something that's really only well behaved in characteristic zero. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out that this always gives some some nice thing giving rise to a nice six hundred formulas. <clears throat> Um, actually, a very interesting example of this is the case where C is of characteristic P. Um, in this case, this gives you one sticky way of talking about something like overconvergent isocrystals. And again, it gives you, for this version of all of isocrystal, it gives you a full 600 on them. Just by importing the one we have in analytic steps. <coughs> um, Sorry. Sorry, could you please remind us uh, what is over convergence in this perfect toy city? It's the same formula. You just take the intersection of all open neighborhoods. Yeah. And that the intersection somehow corresponds to a non completed filter columnar. So, usually in the perfect world, we always take completed columnar, but now, not here. Yeah. <clears throat> um, um, there is actually also something one calls quality. 
unless strong stack compared to CP. Uh, so something that computes the ROM cohomology in character CP. And now you have to be careful that in character CP, the ROM cohomology, when you really want to think computed by differential form, so in the sticky sense, you have to make the, some kind of divided power sticking of the diagonal to get that. Um, <coughs> so now X lives maybe over C, which is some character CP, complete algebraic equals field. <clears throat> um, then I will, yeah, I don't know. That's called the crystalline Um to emphasize this. So it's uh, different from the kind of endless ROM stick that appeared up there. Um, <clears throat> where you form the quotient of X by some divided power version uh, of the diagonal, but you also have to make it over convergent in a funny way. and Giving you the precise formula is a little bit nasty for what, what this thing actually is. And uh, it's a large part of the subtlety of our project. Um, one thing to note, however, is that um, hmm. yeah, actually, before I say that, let me observe that um, as usual in characteristic T, uh, the, the Frobenius map actually means that. Like you have the Frobenius map on X, and the Frobenius map actually factors over this thing. Um, so you actually have a canonical map also from this guy back to X. And if you think, <clears throat> so there's about two ways of thinking about the same stack here. Either there's a quotient of X, in which case this quotient by this overconvergent PD version of the diagonal, or it's living over X, in which case it becomes instead the jerk branded by the same chain, or the jerk branded rather by some of the dependency version. <coughs> yeah. Can you say for A1, what is this PD dagger? Right, so yes, let me say that. I want to do it. Um, Um, right, so, so what is, if you take zero inside, you have a line over, over C and then take it over convergence PD secondary. Uh, <clears throat> I can never remember the formula. Let me tell you what characterizes it. Uh, what characterizes this is that um, if you look, look at representations of this or positive clearing sheets on the, on the quotient stack, um, then there should be a Cartier duality. Uh, that this is the same thing as just positive clearing sheets on the analytic FN line for it. <clears throat> so there's a similar version that uh, if you take Quasi-current sheets on some kind of formal completion of A1, and this is the same thing as representations of the PD hull of zero and A1, or you can also complete PD structures here, then you get, you get full algebraic A1. And this overconvergent version is somewhat characterized by giving you exactly so that like take A1. <clears throat> um, and you can eat it's also the analytic spectrum. Uh, of some algebra, uh, right, let me write down. So it's basically, if you did this over the integers, you would be considering those sums a n times t to the n over n factorial. <laughs> Where if you instead look at the sum of a n times t to the n, uh, this converges in the small <clears throat> Mm 
Uh, right. So in particular, um, this kind of relation here again means that if you, um, if this jerk was trivial, uh, then these things like fiber-wise, you get basically things on such a classifying stack, which corresponds precisely to the and cheese on an A1. And if you unravel this, this means that uh, vector bundles on this, what do they call it? Triple line wrong. Fixing. Um, are twisted versions again. Of fixed bundles on X. Uh, if you think in, in along this realization here. <clears throat> And so this is very much related to this work of Ogos and Wolodowski on some kind of uh, Felix Simpson correspondence mod P, where they are kind of, some just looking at vector bundles here and others are looking at them as some kind of D modules via this incarnation or as some kind of fixed bundles via this incarnation. And there is also a fourth example related a little bit to a top of money, but for time reasons, I'm actually not mentioned this now. <clears throat> and so, so now we have all these examples, but they should all be part of one structure. Like this medical module was one thing, and then we could specialize it to various low loci and then uh, get all these other things. So you can now wonder how should all of these uh, fit into one computer picture. <clears throat> Before you then try to somehow realize this, why I'm this person. All right, I have a question. Uh, there is no map from X to the analytic drum stack of X, or is there exist some? Um, so the yeah. initial drum stack, there is a map. I defined it as a quotient of X. Yes, then why this group is not split? Absolutely not, no, because we identified points, right? I mean, also here, in characteristic P, it's also not split, right? Because we have to apply convenience. Oh. And, and the possibility is that you can almost split up if you mean some of the possible examples of the power series uh, change system. <clears throat> so let's let's again draw my, my favorite picture. Like right, one of these two spec z directions. Um, but now <clears throat> both of these lines should now become analytic. So the best way actually to think about this is that both lines are actually parameterized. By the Berkowitz space of the of the periodic numbers, um, which is somehow an interval from uh, y to the absolute value of p is an interval from zero to one. <laughs> Where I should say that this direction here corresponds to the coefficients of my cohomology series, uh, and this direction here corresponds to the geometry. So. Um, and say, for example, in this example two, uh, they are most cleanly separated. So there, there is a field C where, where my X lives. <clears throat> and then I have some, some X mutated somehow. So bug of particles is kind of found this transmutation, uh, which lives over some C prime. All right. And again, probably of relevance, uh, is a diagonal somewhere in this picture? <clears throat> All right. Uh, so what do we have? So actually, 
Uh, previously on the diagonal, we had we had some state stacks, so so it's re reasonable to guess that along this thing, maybe you should basically get them into some state stack. Uh, this will actually be turn out to be slightly false, but never mind. Um, <clears throat> maybe I should also say that. Um, I mean, I chose a norm now both on my geometry and on my coefficients, and this will be important. Um, but, and sometimes I could both rescale the norm simultaneously. So there's some kind of diagonal R greater than zero rescaling action uh, that doesn't really change anything. So, so if you diagonally rescale absolute values, uh, nothing should happen. Um, all right. <clears throat> now, now let's say we fix, we fix some complete algebraic closed field here. Um, then, I don't know, let's, let's look at it above the diagonal. Then we have some fiber here. And you should think of this fiber as parameterizing all possible sorts of different until C prime with a choice of possibly different norm. And for example, we can put here, here everywhere, these analytic around stacks uh, of different untils. So we do it here, and actually we will do this in the whole region above here. And this also works when the coefficient, I mean, the geometry is in characteristic T. So in this whole region here, um, this will all be analytic to round stacks of answers. Um, when we go to characteristic T and also have our coefficients and characteristic P, that's what this last example here is about. That's this <clears throat> analytic crystalline round stack that we get in the special fiber here. <clears throat> um, and uh, and over this region here, we will actually get something that's uh, what will turn out to be the case that we use generically still such an analytic to round spec, but at a certain specific point, it's an actually an analytic to state spec. Um, and uh, I will draw a better picture in just a second. Um, uh, better, it's a more informative picture. Um, so one thing to not, I want to note at this point, however, already is that we have this diagonal in here, where in the generic public, we have this analytic watch state stack, like for things of a CP and the special fighter, you kind of have this kind of analytic watch state stack, this kind of crystalline drawing thing. And this suggests that there should be some kind of degeneration in some sense from from the stack appearing in the Kedex sense of correspondence to the stuff appearing in the mod T over the Wolobotsky correspondence. And so part of the goal of like realizing this whole picture is to really realize uh, this degeneration between mod T and TP Simpson. So Peter, above the diagonal means that like the norm you chose on P for the coefficients is larger than the norm you chose on P for the. That's oh, right. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's not what you expect it at the at the diagonal some modification happens, and so you definitely want like if you start with the characteristic P fiber here, you want the special fiber to be this kind of thing, and you want the generic fiber to be the thing related to cohort convergent isocrystals, and then that story actually. Uh, I mean, this is the story of part two, which somehow works with all the coefficients. So somehow you can kind of canonically extend it to all this picture, but then you expect some modification to happen at the analytic hot state point. And then you also expect some of them to through be on this picture. <clears throat> and then you expect this analytic hot state state to be somehow periodically repeated uh, at the Frobenius inverse translates, because this is how prismatic cohomology works. It's this kind of hot state state is somehow repeated uh, by Frobenius. And so you expect that up to this modification, you have to do somewhere. Uh, this analytic round stack picture also extends over here, but at, at certain specific points, you do a modification to an analytic watch state stack. Okay. 
there's no return language. There's no return line. There's no what? Eternal line. Yeah, sorry, yeah. So there's also some examples in here. Uh, that's actually the, the example I didn't mention. So I, there is an Italian example, but it's actually the one that's hardest to write down explicitly. <clears throat> um, maybe a different thing I should say is that, uh, <clears throat> like in some sense, there should be a, some kind of geometric space. I'm going to stack to imagine all these different homology series. And this stack, it should map to this physical half open square here. And we can literally ask what the fiber over some such point here is, or some such point here. Um, and basically, the fiber here should be parameterizing different until of the, of the field C, C. And actually, it should basically be the five content curves. So, so the fibers. Of this picture over the top of the square, uh, could essentially be uh, the top and for the CP, what would be the upper What's the moment here? And actually, if you do it above the diagonal, it should actually be the ROM stack of this funny thing, and below the diagonal, it should be a slight modification of it. Um, uh, right, so, yeah. um, and so let's now, let me draw another picture. of a vertical fiber. <clears throat> so let's say we really fix some complete algebraic close field C here with a fixed norm, and then try to understand all the possible cohomology series um, for, for a rigid space over, over C. So, I.e., picture of all the cohomology, analytic prismatic style cohomology series for something like rigid space over C. So most of the examples are some of these analytical realm stacks of different ansels. And different ansels then parameterized by the spark content curve called y0 infinity corresponding to c. <clears throat> so this parameterizes other ansels of c, or of c flat. <clears throat> um, but I want to decouple uh, the norm on the coefficients from the norm on my on my field C. And if you if you somehow have two fields with the same tilt, then actually the, there's a canonical norm you can choose. But so in order to decouple them, I somehow have to rescale arbitrarily the norm now on the answer. So I have to take a product with R greater than zero to parameterize uh, norms. <clears throat> and then it turns out that actually this whole picture should somehow be uh, sometimes periodic. So when, when you scale, when you change an until by Frobenius, 
It's simultaneously changing in the norm, so you have some other Frobenius times multiplication by T uh, to the Z, uh, which should act as automorphism of this picture, and we should be looking at the quotient. And so, because we chose a norm uh, on this thing, the, the norm of T is now a well defined function. And so, this thing, as it should, it maps to zero one, right? Because we have a vertical fiber here, and it should map, it should live over this half open interval zero. And if you analyze what the fibers are, or some non zero point of interval, um, <clears throat> then uh, you're basically killing, killing the rescaling factor. And what you end up with is precisely the far content curve, not the generic fiber of it, because P is non zero, modulo for Venus. Okay. Uh, which is exactly the top contentors. <clears throat> so this is exactly the kind of naive picture we would expect here that we have something that lives over this whole line, and whenever you take any fiber here, uh, we get a copy of the top contentors. And so this means that the vertical fibers of the structures are basically uh, be this kind of structure, uh, of which I will now draw a picture. So it's magic of fiber. Um, I never know how to draw this phi zero infinity. So it's phi zero infinity. Uh, let me draw it. I don't know some, something like that. Um, it has a characteristic key point, <clears throat> and somewhere it has uh, our chosen unfield. Um, and then we have this whole picture times the real numbers. But when we go uh, multiply by t, we end up where we started. And so this means that we have a whole circle of such things. So all of these funny triangles are copies of Weiser and um, And we can act by rescaling the norm. And so by rescaling the norm, we get some kind of flow on this picture, spiraling outwards. <laughs> and it, this flow has one periodic orbit, which is a uh, characteristic key point, which is precisely like, you know, R greater zero of P to the Z, the circle. And now, <clears throat> right, so we have somewhere, this is a completely distinguished point, which is kind of the diagonal in this picture. So this vertical fiber somewhere meets the diagonal, it gives us one point. <clears throat> and then this point is somehow moved by risking the norm to all the different fibers and leaves uh, the different fibers also somewhere. And <clears throat> what happens is that basically everywhere on this picture, we just always get this analytic around stack of, of, of a different until. <clears throat> um, then in characteristic T, we get this funny tall stack that I didn't tell you about. <clears throat> Um, and then uh, I said that above the angles is the round stick everywhere. So if, I, if I'm past in the slow past this point, then here also gets in with the round stick. But if in the slow I'm I'm not yet at, at this distinguished point, then here I get the of space stack. And so then it's repeated everywhere. So in particular at these points here. So I get like here, I get to look at the wrong. But here, I get analytic plus state. Here again, I get analytic plus state. It's also here. And so on. <laughs> and then there's something funny that happens precisely at the point where at the point you have to glue in some modification from the analytic coach state to the analytic ROM stack, which should be somewhat analogous to the so called symptomification. And uh, this is a part of the picture we don't actually understand yet. Um, but in any case, like, 
starting just from considerations of this uh, analytic prismatization, you end up with this picture of spec Z, which now really looks like a three manifold with a flow on it. And um, maybe I should say what we can prove. Uh, uh, I'm out of time already, so I apologize. So, so, um, so next time, so to say. Uh, um, I, uh, we now have found a definition of what an analytic prism is that gives rise to basically all of this picture except what happens at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so at this conference in Princeton in March, uh, I explained such a definition that works in most parts of this picture, but not at the far point. And also not at this characteristic key, characteristic key point. But now we found a way to um, uh, make the analytic prism definition also precise in its characteristic key fiber and have computed that with this definition, we do get the correct guitar and the uh, crystalline DeRam specs. Mm -hmm. All right, then some. <laughs> So thank you. Any further questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, is there any good theory of analytic drum stack for complex variety? Yes. Uh, you can also define the analytic drum stack for the complex elements. Actually, also over an or two Laurent series C, so over any characteristic zero kind of. Norm field. Um, in characteristic uh, or in complex numbers, however, uh, it turns out that it's just isomorphic to the bedding stack, and which gives you some some incarnation of the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. Okay. Thank you. So, in, in context P, uh, the crystalline analytic Durham stack, uh, is this related to arithmetic dimensions? No, no, no. The arithmetic D modules, they are uh, this, 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 this generic part there. Uh, this, this is what I've called overconverted acid crystals. You might also call it arithmetic D modules. So, this, this is the stuff that's related to arithmetic D modules. Okay. I mean, arithmetic, arithmetic D modules, they are a tupi linear theory, right? And so the coefficients should be. I mean, there, there are these subtle, very subtle questions about a good way to extend something like arithmetic D modules integrally. And this theory, although it is somewhat integral, doesn't really answer this question because for like open varieties, we'll usually give infinite dimensional uh, answers. I mean, there's still six functor formulas because we can incorporate infinite dimensional sheaves uh, into our framework without a problem, but we don't answer these. Questions about good integral structures on grid retorts. And the analytic Durham over norm field in characteristic zero, did you answer? I wasn't sure you, I understood what you said. I mean, you can always define it. I mean, the definition is always the same. If, you, if it's smooth, you just take the quotient of X by the overconverging neighborhood of the diagonal. Nothing. Okay. And if you have the complex numbers, it turns out that this is just isomorphic to what. The sex is purely associated with topological space, and oh. where the sheaves on this thing are just baby sheaves. And so then, again, an isomorphism of stacks that the analytic ground stack and the baby stack are isomorphic, and as a consequence, you get the columns of quadric and sheaves, which is some analytic version of Riemann Hilbert. So, what's the relationship between if I have an analytic prismatic? Like sorry, analytic prismatic crystal on X, and I take the limit of prismatic crystals on every model of X. What's the relationship between those two things? Do you know you want us? Yeah. Up to essentially it could be the same, but we're saying the smooth case. Well, um No, I mean, I think I think they're 
they're definitely different. Because so something like the Gauss point is someone you're not making the tangent bundle smaller. You, you, you can, like, if you take the projective line or something, there's a standard model, and then you can roll this up in a special fiber, but you're never modifying it at the Gauss point. <clears throat> but you should modify it at the Gauss point to get the correct representation. So, I mean, what you can do and what uh, Anshit saw in Liberado to define some really state stack is you can try and step try not just to quantify all formal models of, you, of your given X, but also allow arbitrary tall covers and their formal models and then try to do something with this. And they show that on the state locus, it gives you the correct answer. Whether it gives you the correct answer in full. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting question. I want to think about. Yeah, are you working on some uh, overconvergent, uh, overconvergent uh, symptomic homology or symptomification to think artistically? Well, I mean, so currently we somehow have the analog of we have analytic crystallization, and we are aiming also to get some kind of analytic symptomification in the future, which basically amounts, like if you're always see it, amounts to including this point here into the picture. Um, Do you have some Niagara filtration? So can, even in uh, this situation, can you write Niagara filtrations? Uh, so how do you consider? Okay, we're good. Sorry, say so again. I didn't quite catch the question. Yeah, about the Niagara filtration, because here you are working with something like rational theories. So do you have some way to record something like a Niagara filtration for this implementation? Well, Well, first of all, I should say that in some sense, a formal scheme picture should, one should be able to deduce it from the analytic picture in the sense that, <clears throat> like a formal scheme is, also, first of all, the limit of, or co limit of schemes, and so it's not good for sort the of scheme. And schemes, <clears throat> you can always kind of base change them to some auxiliary. I mean, you can just join the wrong series in the next variable T and then to the analytic series there and then kind of try to descend. and. Um, I think this way you more or less can recover the, the usual theory of prismatization from the analytic one. Um, uh, in any case, yeah, so there, I mean, there should be some Niagara filtration here purely in characteristic zero. Uh, but if you have start with the formal schemes, I mean, I mean just the Niagara filtration should somehow be along the complete diagonal, which is now some kind of integral thing. So. Um. So, there you go. So, uh, just to confirm. This fiber, this first product of the far contained curve with the positive reals, this quotient, when you run the box on the right, is this hey. a definition or is this just a heuristic? Is this a definition of an analytic prismatic stack? Well, this, a, this should, should basically be an example of an analytic prism. This is um, a perfect analytic prism. Um, but then to get the current series of prismatic homology, you somehow have to specify what the non perfect examples are. And we, we, in some sense, at the moment, we only have the kind of semi perfectoid ones, but as usual, semi perfectoid ones are, are enough because you can always cover by semi perfectoid ones. And the semi perfectoid ones, there, there are certain, certain types of thickenings of this example. And then we put some subtle condition. Yeah. So basically, an example like this, which is thickened, and where again, the Frobenius X. As, as a Frobenius lift, and so the most subtle part is actually to specify the convergence condition uh, on the Frobenius, and to what extent it is congruent to the Frobenius mod p. There must be some kind of yeah. You have to keep track of some convergence structures there to get to precisely the correct uh, overconvergence PD structures in the end. So, so, so to to. Is there any known re relation of this this picture to to Ethimov's refined TH? Um, <clears throat> when I started thinking about this, I was also motivated by 
some stuff about refined topological motion homology, which in some sense, to find the logic motion homology is able to see stuff starting from this point and then along the spiral, the overconvergent neighbors of this spiral down to the top part. Um, but it's not actually giving you the analytic prismatization because, or at least I didn't see how. So if you try to expect some kind of stacks from this refined TC minus, <clears throat> then it's like the refined TC minus that you have to start with some, some informal model and then later on invert something. And I could never make this really functorial just in the generic fiber. So the, the stacks I could cook up with this type of definition, they were behaving more like the generic fiber of the formal mode state stack or something like this. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a very inconclusive answer I'm giving right now, but um, it, it it feels related. You also, if you think closely about what kind of structure you're actually getting from this uh, fine minus, you're also seeing this kind of real numbers pop up in some kind of spiral like that, which is precisely the overconvergent neighborhood here. So it feels somewhat related, but certainly it only sees part of the picture, only sees the overconvergent neighborhood. And yeah, and there I couldn't quite get the stakes out of this. In terms of the level of detail in the talk, it uh, it, it could seem like this uh, R, like talking about these norms and this R factor is like a cosmetic thing. <laughs> but uh, I was wondering if you could give an indication of in the precise definitions of these objects why uh, why you introduce these norms in the the you know using this replacing the Frobenius discrete action by some flow on this space Y. Um, well, I mean, like if I want some kind of consistent global picture, then and, and work in some kind of analytic setting, then I should be fixing a norm on the geometry and on the coefficients. Um, they, they shouldn't have anything to do with each other because the geometry and the coefficients should be completely like decoupled. Um, and and then I'm just interpreting what I what I have, right? I mean, like when I have a point in the vertical fiber here, I mean I need to specify an unsolved because I, that's where my my new analytic realm stack should live. But I also need to make it norms. So I'm kind of forced to. Yeah, why, do to why do you need to make it normed when, like, for example, the analytic realm stack construction doesn't actually depend on uh, the norm? I mean, only up to equivalence. Um, yeah, but like in the global, like first of all. If I didn't introduce a norm, then um, I couldn't do this. Like, then I would collapse like the actual the real numbers here. But I see that along the edge of the real numbers, something happens. Things a modification from analytic watch data and like the wrong happens. So, someone to get a consistent picture, I definitely have to fix the norm. It doesn't like, like otherwise, like what's below and above the diagonal would get completely blurred. Um, yeah. And. But also, if I want this to be part of the whole spec Z times spec Z picture, then, okay, I mean, I, it could be that I don't have to choose a norm and, and just work on the quotient, but then it becomes more stacky. And so let's see, yeah. and then I see that some of the picture is actually required because otherwise, otherwise I can't fix the point where the modification happens. And maybe, I mean, I should also say that it seems completely crazy to take a product with real numbers here, but in our world of analytic stacks, that's a completely wrong way to say. So the real numbers are a quotient of a locally profinite set, and we can always take quotient products with profinite sets and so on. Yeah, this I know, but yeah. <laughs> you know, but maybe not everyone in the audience. <laughs> okay. Okay, any further questions? If not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Okay.